Hi guys, uh, some of you may know our speaker today is from the American Chestnut Foundation, who we actually collaborate with on an orchard plot over in Mount Combs to try to facilitate the return of the American Chestnut, which I'm sure you'll hear all about today. Um, Jamie Van Cleef began her time at the American Chestnut Foundation as an intern for the New England Science Coordinator while she was completing her Bachelor's of Science in Forestry and Environmental Science uh, at the University of Vermont. After that, she joined the Peace Corps in Panama as an agricultural volunteer in, on an indigenous reservation to support cacao and coffee farmers, and then spent two years at the U.S. Department of Agriculture managing large agroforestry projects, and then came back to the American Chestnut Foundation in 2021, where she's now the Regional Science Coordinator for the Southern Region, uh, which spans North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia, and is now based out of Asheville. Please help me give a warm welcome to Jamie Van Cleef. Well, thank you. I had a whole introduction slide, but that's not really needed as much. Um, but yeah, I'm going to be talking for the foundation, the American Chestnut Foundation, and talk about our race to save the iconic species. Um, this photo here is actually our main uh, research farm in Abingdon, Virginia. It's about three, four hours away from here. We have thousands of chestnuts. It's, it's in the peak of the range. Um, if you guys are ever interested, it is a wonderful place to visit. Um, but of course, the iconic species I am talking about today is the American Chestnut. Uh, our foundation began in 1983, and it's always been a nonprofit grassroots movement. So we have really depended on our 5,000 members that cover 16 different chapters in about 20 different states. Our mission is to return the iconic American chestnut to the native range. Uh, here is one of the more famous photos of chestnut forest back in the day. Uh, as you can see by the man kind of standing in the middle, chestnuts were incredibly large in both diameter and in height. So large, in fact, that they were nicknamed the king of the eastern forest. Personally, I like to say queen of the eastern forest because they have both male and female flowers, but totally besides the point, chestnuts could grow to be over 100 feet tall, they could be up to 15 feet in diameter, and they could live for over 500 years. Here again are some of the classic photos of chestnuts. There on the left is a family standing in front of the base of a chestnut, not even covering the entire diameter. And there you might be able to see the man standing uh, with the red circle around him, really showing just how tall these trees grew. They were um, so tall, in fact, that they actually covered another layer in the canopy. They outgrew all the oaks and beeches and, and pines and would sit above them in the canopy layer. They were incredibly tall trees. Um, the American Chestnut's native range covered about 200 million acres, all the way from the northern part of Florida to the southern part of Canada. Um, the estimated population was about uh, 4 billion, and that is with a B, American Chestnuts. Um, here is an old-timey photo of Shenandoah National Park. Um, in the springtime, chestnuts have these lovely, big, white flowers. And if you talk to people who remember chestnuts, they'll tell you in the spring how the whole mountainsides would turn white. Um, and here, you can see kind of that whole bottom half is covered in chestnut flowers. In areas in the Appalachian Mountains and in the Shenandoah area, it was estimated that the chestnut was one in four trees, even as much as half the trees in the forest. So, with this beautiful tree, there were a lot of uses. Uh, it had a nice straight green timber and a lot of tannins that helped it be rot resistant. So it was used in everything from fine furniture making to the construction of barns and houses. It was used as uh, train rails, as uh, telephone poles, because again, it was almost as rot resistant as something like black locust. Um, of course, it was important in agriculture because you had that yummy nut. Um, those nuts were used as a food source, just as a snack. It was used in creating this really hyper sweet, but yummy beer. Um, it was very popular in baked goods. And then of course, it was also really important for animal husbandry. Farmers who raised pig or cattle would actually just let their, their, uh, cat, their cattle go into the woods and forage on all of the chestnuts when they fell because it was a really nutrient dense, very fat, very full of carbohydrate resource that they could just fatten their lives up for free. And of course, there is a huge social and historical aspect of the American chestnut. 
Um, it is hard to go to any city these days that does not have a chestnut street, a chestnut community. There are chestnut mountains, there are chestnut hills. Um, it was so famous that they have multiple stories, poems, songs about the American chestnut, especially kind of the banger that is chestnuts roasting on an open fire, the popular Christmas song that is probably referenced the most when we talk about chestnuts. Um, so with all of these uses, um, American chestnuts were said to have helped drive an economy and start the economy on the East Coast. An article from the New York Times um, claimed that in certain districts, farmers realized more income from the sale of chestnuts than from any other farm product. And in this case, I am talking about wild trees, not trees that are grown in an orchard or managed. Whole train carts would be filled with chestnuts and they would be shipped from one part of the country to another, especially going to urban areas where they would be sold at stores and also in street corners where you could buy a bag of chestnuts for you know, a nickel to 25 cents. Um, to this day, you can go to New York City and find chestnuts roasting on street corners. Those of course are not American chestnuts, but Chinese or European, but kind of a tip to what used to be uh, happening back in the day. And moving away from anthropogenic benefits, we also have to, of course, highlight how important they were for the environment. Um, unlike other species, like maybe oak, that take about 20 years to have a mast and a really large harvest, chestnuts take about six years. They don't do that cyclical boom and bust that acorns do. They have a consistent uh, crop every single year, and they were so important to our wildlife, everything from squirrels to black bears to turkeys, what have you, and away from our, our furry faces, they also were incredibly important to invertebrates. There are a couple species that have now been either classified as critically endangered or um, extinct, like the chestnut moth and chestnut bee that we can no longer um, find these days. So again, it was an incredibly important species. So I keep talking in the past tense, what happened? Well, this thing called chestnut blight, also known as Chironectria parasitica, is an airborne fungus that enters through cracks in the bark, um, which is very normal in trees as they grow. The bark expands, you know, exposing mm -hmm. parts of the tree. It enters through these cracks and it reaches the cambium layer of the tree and continually eats it away until the tree is girdled. Um, here are a couple pictures of the fungus in action. Here you'll see kind of uh, a canker tree. It's very um, broken up. It looks almost like a wound. I have a couple of petrified sticks up here if you want to take a closer look. That middle picture is uh, <clears throat> showing the orange fruiting bodies. That is the uh, fungus you know, about to reproduce. And then that last picture up there is um, the, actually the sticky phase of the fungus. This is what insects and also people can get on their clothing or on themselves and also help uh, the blight travel. This might be what you find more typically is kind of more of a close up. You can see that middle circle, that is actually where the uh, blight likely entered. And from there, you can see that it's starting to travel up and down the tree, eating away at the cambium layer and producing a fruiting body, so much so that actually even a neighboring uh, sprout is now being attacked by this fungus. So how did it get here? Well, there are multiple species of chestnuts. Um, two, in fact, are from Asia, where this light originated, and they are beautiful trees. They are a little bit shorter than the American chestnut, and they have a wonderful nut crop. So people started importing them for not only nut production, but also ornamental species. And we brought them into the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens, and unbeknownst to us, these Asian species have been co-evolving with the chestnut blight. So while the Asian species are fully resistant to the blight, our American chestnut was fully susceptible. So in 1904, it was introduced, and then every 10 years, this airborne fungus continued to spread and take larger swaths of land um, from the natural range until 1950, when the damage was basically done, and there are only a few lone survivors of chestnuts. Um, this caused, of course, a bit of a pandemonium. All of a sudden, in these areas, trees were just dying very rapidly. You got articles in newspapers saying the chestnuts are doomed, they face sheer destruction. And on top of having this awful fungus attacking these trees, people in other parts of the range started panicking. And they went out into the woods and they harvested every chestnut they could find before the blood came. So at least they could get some value out of the chestnuts. They could at least take the wood and use it. 
Um, so it was kind of a double whammy, but where people didn't come and harvest, this is what remained. This is another photo from Shenandoah National Park. And I would say this is a chestnut graveyard. It just decimated this population. And now some of you might be saying, well, hey, I've actually seen a chestnut, not talking about mountain homes, uh, but in your walk around the woods, and you're right, you might see something that looks like this. So the fungus, as I mentioned earlier, it enters through these cracks and then starts girdling the tree. And what it basically does is it disconnects the roots from the shoots. The roots, though, are able to persist, and they're stuck in this almost depressingly dark romantic cycle where the roots are trying to survive and they'll send up new sprouts to try and get to the age of reproduction to continue their species along. But these sprouts will continually die back from the blight. The blight is endemic. It is not leaving the forest. Um, so it'll it look something like this where you see a bunch of dead snags behind, but have this kind of bushy appearance of the, again, the roots trying to survive. Um, Chestnuts have a unique classification. They're actually functionally extinct. They're not endangered, they're not extinct because there is an estimated 430 million stems out in the woods. But over 95% of those are actually less than one inch in diameter. Um, I also really like this picture, especially when I'm in areas like this, because you'll notice that we are in a hot spot. <laughs> the western part of North Carolina and the eastern part of Tennessee is where chestnuts used to thrive. Um, so with that, I'm gonna take a second because that's kind of more the background of American chestnuts in the blight before I move on to like what we are doing. Are there any questions about the American chestnut or the blight? No pressure, I can continue on. It's always just nice. All right, so now I'll talk about what we're doing. So it's a really tragic story. So what is the American Chestnut Foundation trying to do? Well, we've created an acronym that we call Three Bird. This is breeding, biotechnology and biocontrol united for restoration. It's a play on the fact that the uh, kind of encasing of chestnuts is called a chestnut burr. So kind of threw it all together. Um, the first of which is breeding, the first B. Um, it is an incredibly long-term commitment. Um, our foundation was actually started by a corn geneticist who was a plant breeder. Um, but unlike corn and unlike peas, or, or you know, other agriculture crops, chestnuts actually take six or seven years to reach the point of reproduction. So it is incredibly long-term commitment. What I do today would not be possible without the people who started before me. Uh, but the idea was to start breeding chestnuts together because there are four different major chestnut species. There's the American chestnut, Chinese chestnut, European and Japanese chestnut. As I mentioned before, both the Asian species have resistance to the blight. So the idea, was to take an American chestnut that can grow to be 100 feet tall, that could be a dominant canopy tree with a straight trunk and few lower branches, and breed it with the Chinese tree to get blight resistance. Uh, one more note here. A lot of times I get a question, like, why don't we just plant Chinese chestnuts? Well, from this chart, you can see Chinese chestnuts just don't grow to be that tall. If we were to start planting them in the East Coast forest, they would continually live in the lower canopy. For a chestnut to really survive and thrive and have that really nice nut production, they need full sun. So this Chinese chestnut would basically forever be stuck in the understory. Um, so it's one of the major reasons why we can't just replace the American chestnut with this. So this is what the foundation's original model was. It was to take a Chinese tree, an American tree, breed them together to get a 50-50 hybrid, and then back cross it, which is a really common plant breeding technique. The idea of back crossing is basically diluting the Chinese genes out of there. So it looked like an American chestnut, it acted like an American chestnut, but had those genes for blight resistance. Um, and this was an incredible effort that we started. It took hundreds, I'd say thousands of volunteers in, in uh, running chestnut orchards from Alabama to Maine. Uh, we have, I, I don't even know the exact number, it's hundreds of thousands of chestnuts in these orchards. Um, it's just an incredible, incredible grassroots movement. But with that, the foundation and the original model, it was based on old science. As the field of genetics has been advancing so rapidly, uh, we've been able to kind of reevaluate that model. 
that original model was based on the idea that there were maybe three to six genes responsible for plague resistance. As we've been able to now take the entire sequence, the genome, uh, we've been able to take a lot of leaf samples and send them into our partners. We have found that there actually might be hundreds of small additive genes responsible for blight resistance. So we have had to learn and adapt. And what does that mean for all those thousands of trees? Well, a lot of them still look really good. So while we're not at the number that we were hoping to have at this point, we actually still have dozens of trees that are phenomenal in terms of their blight resistance and their form. And now with the help of genetic analysis, we take we can inoculate a tree, test it to see if it actually has the blight resistance. We can take a leaf sample, send it into our partners, um, and then we take some phenotypic data to also match with that. We've been able to make some selections of our best of best trees that actually show really good promise for blight resistance. Um, these trees tend to be somewhere around 70% American instead of that 15th, 16th, uh, but with those, we're continuing the breeding effort. The second is biocontrol. This is the second B of the three birds. This is um, the most complicated one. It's some real mad scientist stuff. It's incredibly fun to, to really look into this. The basic idea of hypovirulence is we can take this, this blight, we can put it in these petri dishes and we can inject it with a virus. And it makes it so weak that the actual blight doesn't impact the chestnut that much. This is actually what's been used primarily in Europe um, to stop the spread of the blight. Uh, unfortunately for American trees, there's a lot of vegetative uh, compatibility issues. And we actually keep making the blight so weak that it's not spreading. Um, so we can inject it into one tree and it does a really, really good job of protecting maybe one tree. Um, but in terms of a, a, a restoration of the scale that we're doing, we can't go into 20 states and inoculate 4 billion trees with this. So it's really, it's a great resource for maybe tree breeding, but it's not really um, the most likely one to help bring the species back. And then finally, the most exciting and most controversial is biotechnology. Um, we have partnered with SUNY ESF up in New York. And they have been working uh, for the past, I think, two decades. And they have taken this gene that creates this thing called oxalic oxidase. It is incredibly commonly found in dark leafy greens and in studio crops. Um, it is incredibly common because it's a great way um, it's a, of neutralizing one of the main attacking mechanisms of funguses. Uh, this thing called oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is actually what's responsible for eating away at cell walls. So by inserting this gene, um, they have successfully found a way to basically neutralize the blight. Um, it is now going through permitting and deregulation. I will say it speaks to chestnuts that we have to go through the USDA, FDA, and EPA, because again, it is an agriculture crop. It is a wild tree, and it's also a food crop. Food, so we have to get a lot of paperwork. Each of our reports have been over 500 plus pages with so many different research papers attached. Um, this was submitted in fall of 2019. We had a public comment period and overwhelmingly it has been positive. As the years have gone on, we've had more public comment periods and it's been increasingly, increasingly positive. Um, again, as I mentioned, these reports have been massive because we have had to create studies for basically most things that you can imagine. We have studied leaf litter decomposition. We have studied herbivorean leaves. We have made sure that it's okay for tadpoles in case it falls into rivers. We have looked at mycorrhizal communities, pollinators, and over and over again, we are finding that adding basically two genes because it's one for the oxalic acidase and it's one for the marker. So we can always make sure and find it in our testing that there is no difference between the transgenic and non-transgenic chestnut. The most common question that I get when I give talks is like, when can I have it? Um, I will say, especially in the South, there seems to be a little bit more enthusiasm for it. People are like, give me now. And I love it. And I wish I could. But we are still waiting for that uh, approval from the federal government. I will say that in last August, they gave us this, which says we plan to complete a decision within two years of this notice, meaning it might be here by August. But I will also say, 
This schedule is tentative and subject to extension. So maybe, you know, and, and then again, sometimes we hear it might be here by this spring, which is exciting, but then sometimes it, it's just, I wish I could give people a firmer answer in this. We are at the mercy of the federal government. So who knows? Um, and then I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about what I think is really exciting. This foundation has now been here for 40 years. And for this entire time, we've been so focused on getting a disease resistant chestnut. Um, and now we're at a point where we're actually thinking we're gonna have it. We're gonna have it in the next decade. So now it's this question of, oh man, how do we get 4 billion chestnuts? I don't think we'll ever quite get to that number again, but we need to start thinking about big scale and a lot of trees. So once we get this regulatory approval, and as we continue to do our traditional breeding and improve our stock, we're gonna be optimizing pollen production. We now have six highlight growth chambers uh, across the range. This basically puts a seedling under 24 hour growth lights, um, meaning that we can get pollen production in a year, which is really exciting. These trees after being stressed out, um, you should pass. So we can, but we were able to collect this pollen and use it to pollinate on back cross trees and wild chestnuts and orchards throughout the range. Um, we can then test them, both the leaf tissue to make sure it actually has those genes for blight resistance, or we can test it to see if it has the transgenic gene. We can establish a network of seed orchards like we have very locally here. Um, and then that's the fun thing where we have to wait. There's nothing we can do in terms of actually getting the female flowers. There's no way of expediting that. It can be as soon as six years, but it really starts to peak around 10 years. Um, after we finally get those chestnuts, we can start putting them in nurseries and distributing them out to landowners and into the woods. Um, it's overwhelming, and I always have to put a plug again. We are a grassroots, and our workforce is primarily volunteer based. We've recorded over 25,000 hours of volunteers hours a year. We have 18 staff. This is a restoration on a scale that's never been known before. Uh, we so depend on people's help and, and people's time for this uh, effort. So if you're excited, which I hope you are, and you're asking yourself, how can I help? Well, you can become a member of TACF. Uh, the Tennessee chapter has a variety of orchards, including one very locally. There is a student rate, if that is something actually of interest to you. And the second thing is outreach. Um, a lot of people don't know the story. Uh, given that it was one of maybe the biggest ecological disasters to hit the United States, it is sometimes um, kind of shocking just how little people actually know about this. So if we can just tell people casually and spread the word around, it means a lot. Sometimes people ask me what I do for a living and I'm like, sit down. It's gonna take a couple minutes. Um, and then plant something. So if you see a chestnut or you have an orchard or land, please continue to plant chestnuts. Mm -hmm. The more chestnuts that we have available with female flowers, the faster we're gonna be able to restore the species. And then mainly for you guys, my call out would be, if you find a new tree, a new chestnut, let us know. We are in the hot spot for chestnuts. Um, and there are two major ways of doing that. The best one, I would say, is the tree lake locator form. It's when you take a leaf, you press it, and you send it into me with the GPS uh, coordinates and some other information as you're willing to. This means I definitely know where it is, and I'll put it into our database. The easier and the more 21st century way of doing it is tree snap. It is an app that you can get at the Apple Store, Google Store. I clearly use apples, um, but it's an app that you can download. If you see an American chestnut, it's gonna ask you to take a picture of it. It's gonna take your GPS coordinates. It's gonna ask you some other questions about canopy health, uh, if it's flowering, if I can't totally remember, but there's like five other questions and then you submit it. And researchers and scientists such as myself have access to this information. So we can go back and as we continue to um, push for germplasm conservation, we can find wild trees. One thing that's really, really important for us is capturing as much of the diversity in the population as we can. We do not want to create a bottleneck effect. We want to have a diverse, healthy chestnut population. The more diverse it is, the more able it's going to be to survive uh, climate change, to survive other things that might come and impact it. 
Uh, and we have found over and over again that the southern population is the most diverse. So it really, really is important to get these trees. Um, even if the tree is not flowering and producing pollen or nuts, we have actually become pretty adept at, at grafting trees. So we're able to even just graft them. And again, we could put them in the high, highlight chambers, grab the pollen and use them for breeding. Um, <laughs> so, and then finally I have to plug this because you guys have this awesome seed orchard really, really close. I think it's what, 20 minutes away. Um, there are over 1200 trees there. Um, they come from 14 different back cross lines. So they're a mixture of Chinese and American. Um, it's, I really can't say it's like an invaluable resource to have all those chestnuts in one spot when it comes to the point where we're going to be breeding in blight resistance to be able to hit, you know, I will say we're going to keep planting there, but we're also going to lose a bunch. But to even be able to pollinate a hundred or so trees with either transgenic pollen or the traditional pollen, we can get such a big harvest. And those could be the trees that actually repopulate the forest around here or the Smokies. Every single tree in that orchard is from Tennessee. So these are, again, this is the population that hopefully will bring back chestnuts to this area. So it's a beautiful orchard. I, I really like weeds, nose weeds. It's a great place. And I really, really can't wait for the future of this orchard as it continues to grow and reach that age of reproduction. Um, I usually end on this because it really resonates with me. I wish I could come back in a hundred years and see my trees. Every day we're out there planting more trees. As I mentioned before, I couldn't do what I do today without the people 40 years ago who started this program. I am so excited to see what will happen with the American chestnut in a hundred years. And ideally I will see them back covering the hillsides with a white flower every spring. So with that, I think I kind of rushed through that a little bit, but questions. I don't know. I noticed earlier you were talking about how we like we don't really want to plant Asian or Chinese chestnuts because of the height that they get to, they don't get quite tall enough. So how is it like made sure that the trees that are crossbred with them will actually get to that height if it takes them like so many years to actually get that policy? No, it's a good question. Um, so that I mean that's the whole idea of the, the back crossing is basically diluting the Chinese genes out of that. Um, like light resistance, there are a lot of genes responsible for, for actually the height and the growth pattern of the chestnut. So as we continue to introduce more and more American genes back into it, it is more likely that it will be growing to the height. Again, we've only been doing this for about 40 years. So <clears throat> that's kind of the tricky part with the chestnut because these trees can be a 500 years old. So what will these actually look like in 500 years? It's a great question. I mean, we have trees and orchards that are far beyond 60 feet at this point, but what will happen in a hundred years? It is, it is a question we are constantly asking yourself. Um, but again, it, we are losing chestnuts all the time every day, especially in the South. Uh, those like bushy chestnuts that we find uh, will go back in two years and they're no longer there. So we're kind of at a point where we can't wait for 500 years. So we are basing it off the theory that the more American genes we have, uh, the more likely it'll grow to that size. Are you worried about genetic drift as it relates to introducing the blight resistant ones back into the wild population? Like what, how are you offsetting that? Or like how many blight resistant ones do you have to put in the area for that to not yeah. be an issue? So it, it's, it's something that um, we have um, a geneticists on our team and we're also working with a couple of other uh, plant geneticists on this and they have given us a really good framework to work with. Um, our population analysis has shown us that there's three major populations of chestnut, the north, mid, and then the south. Um, again, being the most diverse, and they've given us tree, like at the amount of trees that they would like to see in each of these populations represented um, in the uh, GE tree. Okay. So before we do kind of a large scale restoration effort with the GE trees, we need to hit those numbers to avoid that because we really are trying to prevent the spawn neck effect. Um, and then again, so this one transgenic tree was started from one tree in New York. And so we've been actively under permit in as many locations as possible, then diversifying that tree out um, as much as possible. So we're now on the fifth generation of transgenics. 
So I think we have 40 different mother trees in that transgenic program. The goal is quite a bit more, but um, under our current, you know, our hands are kind of behind our backs right now because we only have so many permits that we're able to actually use this transgenic tree. And in the South, there's only one other tree. So. Those of you that have heard speak about the future of transgenic trees and our orchard, that's that's part of the delay. Is that there has to be a continued process of permit to allow that to happen. So we'll get there then. Yeah. Or we're we're really excited. It, it does seem like it's coming in the near future where we'll have the actual ability to to kind of pollinate as we'd like. Um but yeah, again, at this point in the south, we have one orchard and one orchard only where we can have these trees. So do you think, would there be any like bad effects to a chestnut becoming like the dominant species once again? Like would it have to be other like oaks that have taken its place or maybe cause some bad effects like the species that have those? It's going to be really interesting to see how the forest composition changes. I think I'm actually kind of more excited for oaks now because there's a lot of enthusiasm behind chestnut restoration and you can't do chestnut restoration without oaks and hickories. So as we go into forest plots that traditionally are suitable for those species, the whole idea um, when we talk with forest service staff is as we do these chestnut restorations, we're going to be putting in oaks and um, hickories along with them. But yeah, I mean, in the past, they that was the community. It was hickory, hickory, oak, and chestnut. So the idea of returning them, I think, will only be a value add to the oak populations instead of a, um, yeah, a negative. But yeah, no, and it's already on the table as we talk about chestnut restoration. Any large scale planting we do, it's going to hopefully be incorporating some of these other ones because oaks are on the decline too. Um, and it's, yeah, we don't want to forget about the cousins, they're actually in the same family. So, are you guys looking at other genes for transgenic use? Because yes. I do worry about, oh, we are all pathogen getting resistance, right? So it's always going to be that word. That is, I think, when we get negative comments for the deregulation, that is the one that we get the most. And it is, for every single one of us, the scariest. Because, yeah, for, for corn resistance, for BT resistance, they put in at least three genes. Just, again, so they kind of have genes to fall back on. Right now, we have one gene, uh, this oxalic oxalidase that we're putting in there, and there is a chance that the blight will be able to evolve um, and kind of get around it. So we are on a very rapid search right now. We are very, very much looking into that. We have two pretty strong leads right now um, where we're just trying to make sure we don't just put one gene as the pillar for this entire species, because that could be a problem. And again, if you look at my, you know, like Syngenta and, and these other breeders, they never just put one. They always try and have a fallback. So we are we are looking for that. Um, the idea right now is we're still pushing this one along because once ideally we get one G to prove the chestnut, and as we find more, we won't have to do the eight to 10 year regulation process. So it was kind of more of a, let's get this going and we'll, we'll, we'll hit the ground running as much as we can with the idea of incorporating more. Yeah, no, that, that's a really, really good question. I'm glad you brought it up. So if it is approved before another gene is found, it, are y'all just gonna go forward with just the one gene? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna again, hit the ground running and as much as we can, because with the transgenic tree, tree, they are able to survive and grow, um, kind of unlike some of our back cross materials because they don't have to worry about blight. So they're actually able to put on a lot of growth. Um, and hopefully those transgenic trees will also be able to reach the age where they're flowering and then we can breed with those as well. So it's, you know, we're not worried about, you know, it, we're not worried about it failing. I think it's only going to be, again, an ad. Is there any thought that providing this one gene could give the tree a little more of hope in developing its own resistance? I'm sorry. I, I, so, so you're giving it this one pillar gene, this oxaloacetate. Uh, would that then give the trees that are trans uh, to be able to develop their own additional resistance? In other words, is it going to give them? Because the they can actually evolve. I mean, that, yeah. that's part of the thing. Like the Chinese chestnut had 
hundreds of millions of years to co-evolve with this flight, where the American chestnut just got wiped out. And so, yeah, that's a theory that maybe the fact that it's actually going to be able to reach the age of reproduction, it might actually be able to start evolving. Because at this point, it's just been stagnant. So again, to get to that point where it can reproduce, like we don't want to stop because we're really excited just to have those trees that are going to be able to be healthy and survive. So. You talked about three like distinct regions or three distinct populations uh, that they're looking at. When you go and start implementing this, as far as like generating, I guess, funding for you guys to carry on, like how are you approaching that? Are you like going to try to develop tourism? Or, like what what is the long-term plan like post you start to see some success? How do you keep the operation going? And what are the next steps? Like should everything continue to pan out and be positive? Like how do you... How do you then turn like the foundation, like how does the foundation move forward? I guess that's my question. Like, do you move to the next tree that is in trouble or do you? That's yeah. kind of the long-term plan of okay. having a playbook to help other species. Um, I mean, we partner with a bunch of other um, nonprofits. We work with the Hamlet Foundation. We're working with all researchers. But when we get that question, the first thing I had to say is like one tree at a time. Yeah. Because uh like I, I even actually had a dinner party there so i was like just chestnut i was like you have no idea it is like, it is it's, again this is such a large scale project um until we have success with one we're not really trying to move to there but at the same time like i i talk and i work with some other foundations out there um and i think we've had a lot of failures but we've also had a lot of successes and we share that very openly um that whole model that we had I mean, that's an example of where, hey, we, we were wrong, you know, like we weren't completely wrong, but that the old basis, it was only a couple of genes that we could share that kind of experience and what that meant, but also what it's brought. Like now we have hundreds of thousands of chestnuts to work with because of that backcross program and how great that is now that we have that science that caught up with us. Um, long answer, yes, we are hoping to create a playbook. We are hoping to work with other species. questions so i'm trying to think so this is um two sticks with petrified blight on them i think we're going to see some blight in the orchard today i don't know are all of you guys coming not all um but yeah so this is again uh it's been shellacked so uh, it stays like this forever but this is kind of the example of this orange kind of fruiting body color that you see right before it's about to reproduce. Um, and then here we have this kind of gnarled canker uh, that is where the chestnut blade kind of came in. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think, just, um, and then one thing I always just want to kind of end on to is, is this question about a 500 year old tree and this transgenic thing. We're really excited about the transgenic, it's showing a lot of promise. Um, I also want to put a caveat that like, this is a 500 year old species and we are not, entirely sure what's going to happen. So there is no silver bullet to this. There's no one gene that's going to fix everything. So I think that's part of the messy, fun part of science and this foundation is throwing everything against a wall and seeing what sticks. And we're combining approaches. We are um, adapting as we need to. But um, yeah, again, it's there's no silver bullet, but we're, we're working with it. And we have a lot of wonderful partners, including <clears throat> university partners like you guys. But, I'll move this along. Any other questions? All right, well, let's give our speaker another round of applause.